Hello everyone and today we're going to look at making our own pulse sensor. For those of you that have used pulse sensors before or have any experience with them, a very common pulse sensor is this Senex first look sensor. Um, they do a good job of measuring pulses. They're, a lot of people think they're pressure sensors but really they're pressure change sensors or pulse sensors. Meaning if I were to take this tool right here, hook it up to a scope, and blow in the end of this thing, I would see the pressure go up and then it would level back off. And then when I took my mouth off of it, it would go negative and come back off. So they do a good job of measuring the change in pressures. So it makes it useful for a variety of different things. So for example, hooking this up to a intake manifold vacuum and let it measure the pulses in the intake manifold vacuum. If we had an issue with an intake valve, we would see when the piston's coming down and that intake valve is opening or supposed to be opening, either it'd have that pulse or there'd be an absence of that pulse. Or if that intake valve was leaking, when the piston's coming up on its compression stroke, some of that would leak back into the intake and we would see that pulse of that pressure going feeding back into the intake and that would affect the pattern. This tool here is useful for other things. Some people will use it in the exhaust and you can measure the exhaust pulses. So when an engine's running and every time a cylinder fires and the exhaust valve opens, you're going to get this pressure pulse in the exhaust system. And if you put a tool, a pulse sensor like this in the exhaust system, it's going to be able to measure that pulse. If you have a misfire or a cylinder that's not quite contributing, you're going to have a different strength pulse or it's going to alter that sequence in the exhaust stream. Another use for this sensor would be to put this hose over the dipstick tube on the engine and this pulse sensor will, that will, will then be able to measure the pulsations that occur from combustion. Anything that's leaking past the piston rings and creates a positive pressure situation in the crankcase is going to be measured as a pulse. So if I've got a piston, uh, excessively worn piston rings, I'll be able to pick that up with the sensor. And if I synchronize it to a cylinder, to a, like an ignition event, I'd be able to figure out what cylinder is more um, likely going to have worn out piston rings. Some people have gone through and hooked this up to the, like a radiator cap adapter, like especially if you've got a pressure adapter for your uh, cooling system pressure test kit, you put this on there and you hook it up to the scope and you measure any pulsations that are occurring in the cooling system. So if you have a head gasket that's leaking and it's pushing combustion pressures into the cooling system, this would measure that pulse and you'd be able to synchronize that to figure out what head gasket and what cylinder it's leaking. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, benefits to using this tool. One of the other benefits and, and um, processes, and I'll show you guys this later in this uh, video during the like application portion of this, is you can also use this to measure, pick up noises. And um, I find this pretty helpful for picking up engine noises, lifter ticks. Uh, it can even pick up injector ticks, believe it or not. So you can put this right on the injector rail and you can, uh, the sensor will pick up the high frequency pulses that are coming from the injectors. And you can actually make one on your own. So you don't have to go out and buy this one if you don't want. You can make one on your own. This right here is a, I bought a bunch of these things from Radio Shack years past. Um, you can still buy these right off of the Radio Shack website. They're about six bucks, I think. They're not that expensive. If you go to DigiKey, this is a piezo sensor. And if you go to DigiKey, they've got thousands of piezo sensors and you can match up the specs if you want. Basically, I've got about 10 of these, so I've made a few of these. The part number is 273-073. And like I said, this costs only like $6. And if you wanted to, you could spend even less by getting some from DigiKey. The spec on the back side of this says it's a 30 volt peak to peak max. These piezo sensors, I think this is like really more used as a buzzer. So, or an alarm. So if you power this thing up and fed an oscillating signal to it, it can create a chirping sound like a, an alarm type sound. But we're going to use it in the opposite. We're going to use it to, to collect pulsations and generate a voltage. And you could just go to your hardware store and pick up some PVC pipe. These are end caps for one inch. And if you take one inch PVC pipe, if you take a look, it fits in there. There's a little bit of looseness. So we're going to cut these ends off and glue in this piezo sensor with the hole facing out. I'm going to glue it in as far as I can down there. So before that, I'm going to go ahead and solder some machine screws to the terminals 
and I'll drill some holes in the end here and stick these out, that'll give me a spot for my alligator clips to clamp onto. So drill a couple holes in that one inch PVC end cap so that we'll have a place to stick our studs that we soldered that piezo sensor to. So now I've got the hole drilled in the end of this one inch PVC end cap and that's where I'm going to attach my hose so I can do my measurements and my tests too. Uh, this is just a little barb fitting that is a quarter inch pipe tap thread and that should work fine. You can get different sizes for different hoses. Alright everybody it's time for little arts and crafts. I got my glue gun out here ready to go. I got this one inch PVC pipe, it's got a couple holes drilled into it. That is where my little studs for my piezo sensor are going to poke through, give me a spot to clamp my alligator clips to. And now the next step is, is I'm going to go ahead and chop these little ears off this piezo sensor, tuck these wires in there and glue this piezo sensor in there. I want to glue it down there as far as I can. I'm going to warn you. I don't have much experience with the old glue gun. I'm not a, a master at the glue gun, unfortunately. So it's not going to look pretty, I'm sure of it. So hopefully I can glue gun that in there without making too much of a mess. Probably the best job I've ever done right there. So I will say I'm pretty proud of myself. So while this sets up, let me tell you of a few things I've done. I've already made one of these and played around with it. This is the, the actual, the first prototype is this. I, I thought I was gonna be persnickety and take an aluminum pipe. I even welded little tabs and which didn't work. Go figure. And um, I just use silicone to silicone that in. I just leave the back exposed. And then I just take these wires, I didn't even get fancy, I just clipped the alligator clips to it. It works, it's just not, it was just, I don't know, too much work for what I was doing there. I was just having fun playing around with the welder. And then the, when I switched over and tried a PVC pipe, I did the exact same thing I'm showing you here. I got the two little bolts, uh, studs poking through, and that is where my piezo sensor is wired up to that. I marked negative on this one, so that way I don't think it really matters. It's going to produce an AC signal anyway. And um, I didn't push it in probably as far as I should have. And my, my, my glue gun job is pretty crappy. And then I also um, made this cap variable. Like, for example, I've got this tube right here that you can see that slides in and out. And I machined a little O-ring groove on there. So my idea was is I might check to see if when I'm checking pulses, if lengthening or shortening the tube makes a difference. And I really didn't notice a difference. So that's why I'm not going to bother with this one. So once this thing sets up and once we're done, we'll go ahead and do a comparison. We'll put this on a vehicle. We'll check some intake pulses on an engine that runs fine. Check some intake pulses on an engine that's not working well. And we'll also do some uh, measurements on some noise and see how they compare. As you probably notice, if you work with some of these late model vehicles, sometimes it's becoming more difficult to find a place to tap in a vacuum gauge or a pulse sensor. So that's the case on this Chevy truck. What I've done is I've taken the map sensor and I made myself a little adapter. Get it off of there. I don't know if these are commercially available or not. So as you can see here, this little piece I made out of aluminum, 
This is the MAP sensor O-ring or AMAP sensor O-ring that'll fit into the intake manifold. And then I'll connect the MAP sensor onto this side. And this is a little eighth inch pipe thread with a barb on the end so I can put a vacuum gauge or I can go ahead and put the pulse sensor on it. So basically what I'm doing is I'm extending the MAP sensor opening and giving me a place to tee in. And it works well. It's right inside there. So now I'm going to start this truck up and one of the things you're going to notice is on channel C there's going to be a lot of noise and I'm going to have to filter that out. I'm not 100% certain if my first look sensor isn't acting up. I'm pretty sure in the past I've not seen so much noise on, these, um, on the first, first look sensor circuit. But I'll switch it over to the homemade transducer and you're going to see it's like going to be a lot cleaner signal. It's a lot of noise on this signal here coming from the first look sensor. I'll go ahead and unplug it and we'll go ahead and put the homemade uh, pulse sensor on there. Here you can see the pulses look pretty good on the homemade pulse sensor. Let's take a look at this running capture and channel A here has got the pulse sensor pulses and channel B is the ignition for cylinder number one. So you can kind of see here we've got this little ID chart here. It's an overlay that shows you the firing order 18726543 and it labels out what's on compression, um, power, the exhaust and intake stroke. So since I am in the intake manifold or I'm measuring intake pulses, I'm looking for the intake valve and that's everything in blue. So you can see the first intake valve pulse that occurred right after our ignition event for cylinder one was cylinder six. So I went ahead and marked that cylinder six. So this pulse right here is more than likely cylinder six and then it follows the, um, the firing order right after that. So six, five, four, three, then we're back to one, eight, seven, two. So if we had an issue with an intake valve and we use this overlay, we would look to see basically what intake event occurred within the firing order after we synchronized it with this ID chart and uh, the firing order. And of course, there's nothing wrong with this engine, so really we're just learning off of it. Another thing techs like to do when using pulse sensors or pressure transducers is see what the pattern looks like just during a cranking event. So let's try that. A crank, no start. So one thing to remember that there's nothing wrong with this Silverado that we're testing right here. This is just kind of a baseline. And you can see this doesn't look that much different from the running compression or the running pulse test that we did. Uh, the pattern maybe looks a little more jagged, but you got to remember that there's very little intake manifold vacuum. So it's probably picking up a lot more of the irregularities that are going on. Obviously, if we had a intake valve issue, we would probably see that show up very well in this pattern. On this cranking test with my first look sensor, you can see there's quite a bit of noise and I'm almost 100% certain there's an issue going on either with the sensor or the lead. So you might not take uh, a lot of these first look sensor um, readings at face value. It is a good sensor, but for some reason I've been having an issue. You can see without any filtering that there's quite a bit of noise and it's a little harder to tell what you're looking at. Once filtered and zoomed in a little bit, it almost looks similar to the shop made one. There's quite a bit of irregularities and jaggingness to the pattern, but once again, this is a cranking test, so we're not dealing with much intake vacuum during this type of a test. So now we're here at an engine that has an issue, and we're gonna see if this shop made transducer or pulse sensor, and this one you can purchase has the ability of checking the engine mechanical like we hope. First, I'm going to start with a cranking test. So here we got the cranking test from the first look sensor. Now we're going to go ahead and do a running test with the first look. 
We'll let this run for a bit, then we'll save that image. We'll filter it down and see what it shows us. Looking at that cranking event from that trailblazer with the first look pulse sensor. I've got my ID chart kind of spread out across the ignition event. So I can see where cylinder one is firing and then 720 degrees around it fires again. So I can span my ID chart across that. And those ID charts are great because they show, you know, you, have, you enter the firing order, 153624. And then it shows you where the valve events are occurring at any given time. It's roughly, obviously, it's not precise. So the cylinder six intake stroke is occurring and that's likely this pulse right there. And then the next one would be cylinder two, and that's likely this pulse right there. And then the next one is cylinder four, and you can see we're missing a pulse. That's where it should be occurring. And then after four, we're back around to cylinder one, and that's this pulse. And five actually looks like it has an issue. It should be this pulse right there. And then we're back to three. So it looks like we've got two issues going on with this, like cylinder five and cylinder four. Not good. This is the first look sensor on the Trailblazer while it was running. And as I mentioned before, we I, I do have a lot, an issue with this sensor. It's got a lot of noise, so this had to be filtered pretty heavily. But I went ahead and still displayed this. You can see I've got my ID chart spanning across that ignition event so we can figure out our valve events. And right here you can see cylinder six. You can see the uh, when the intake valve opens, it does pull it down. And then when cylinder two intake valve opens, it pulls it down. And then when cylinder four intake valve opens, or is supposed to open, it doesn't pull it down. Actually, pressure climbs up. And then one, when it operates, it pulls it down. Five gets pulled down, three gets pulled down, and so forth. So this running capture here from the first look sensor definitely shows a problem. But like I said, this I had to filter it heavily, so I don't think it's an actual true representation of what that pattern would look like. If I didn't have an issue with my sensor going on. Now let's go ahead and try the shop made pulse sensor and see how it does in comparison to the other one. First we'll start cranking. Now we'll do that same test with the engine running. Looking at the homemade tool and on the Trailblazer, the cranking, you can see it did a pretty good job of identifying this uh, issue with our intake valve. Number six pulls down strong, two pulls down strong, four doesn't pull down at all, and then one pulls down really strong, and five pulls down, and then three looks a little weak also. And that kind of repeats itself right down the row. And now this is the shop made pulse sensor with the Trailblazer while it's running. And I think it actually does a better job than cranking showing us the problem. You can see number six has a good pull, downward pull. Two does, four doesn't. One pulls down strong, kind of compensating for the lack of pull on number four, five, and then three. So even during cranking, I'm seeing an issue with like cylinder three. It doesn't really show up as much while the engine's running. Maybe that's something still worth looking at though. These tools can also do a pretty good job of checking to see if injectors are physically opening or not. This is kind of a neat little experiment to do with that shop made pulse sensor. Is here I'm just touching the fuel rail on the um, Trailblazer and it's picking up the injector pulses. Now some of them are stronger than others and for some reason this vehicle doesn't even set a misfire code even though it has a dead cylinder but we know that typically a injector fires on the exhaust stroke so this looks like this pulse right here looks like it's cylinder number two this pulse is four this pulse here is cylinder one's injector firing this one's cylinder five and then three and then two so just by touching the fuel rail, we can actually pick up the injector pulsing, this reverberation that occurs through the fuel line. So here we are at a Honda Pilot. You can probably hear a little bit of that knocking. Let's see if I bring my microphone a little closer. Now 
But with this little shot main pulse sensor, we're gonna go ahead and see if we can't figure out where that noise is coming from. So looking at this Honda with the little engine tick sound, you probably saw in the video where I was uh, disabling some of the cylinders to see if the noise went away. You probably also noticed because the microphone did a pretty good job picking up the noise. Uh, matter of fact, it wasn't really that bad in real life. The microphone almost um, over um, exaggerated the noise, but the, um, the noise didn't go away when I unplugged all the different cylinders. So here I've got the scope capture and you can see this peak here and that peak there uh, that is the noise that we're hearing and I've stretched this overlay chart on my ignition pulse I was synchronized on cylinder number five that was the easiest one to get to so the firing order is one four two five three six but since I synchronized on five I've got five on the top and then you see my overlay shows the approximate location of the power exhaust intake and compression strokes and right where that noise is occurring, you can see I've got an exhaust valve closing and an intake valve opening on cylinder number six. So that's a pretty easy one to get to. Um, hopefully it's just a valve adjustment, which these things, as you know, these Hondas, they actually do have, because of their VTAC system, they have uh, adjustable rocker arms so you can set valve lash. So that's a quick way to kind of determine is it a valve issue um, and what cylinder it is the reason why this could be helpful is because sometimes when you take these things apart and you look at them like let's say I took this apart and the valve lash was fine well now I can look really close at cylinder number six to see if there's any camshaft damage rocker arm damage or valve damage uh, if I didn't do that ahead of time I'd be kind of lost and I'd probably have to put it back together and try to figure out where that noise is coming from. These types of tests will help you especially if you don't see anything by the naked eye when you take it apart. It kind of lets you hone in on a specific area knowing that you did the measurements ahead of time. So anyway I thought that was kind of a fun little uh, case study there with the pulse sensor. I mean less than ten dollars it's basically like a stethoscope but this is a stethoscope that you can synchronize on a scope to an ignition event so that way you can pinpoint what cylinder has actually got the problem. This here is that same Honda engine tick but I went ahead and threw on the intake pulses just for good measure to see if anything would just kind of surface or show up. And you can see with these intake pulses they look pretty even, pretty consistent and I really wasn't expecting to see anything. Like uh, this thing did not have a drivability problem, it just had noise. So I was just putting this on there. If it was a valve lash issue, more than likely if the valves were too tight, the intake pulses would have a irregular pattern to it. But just the fact that there might be some looseness in the, in the valve train that would create some ticking sounds doesn't necessarily mean I'm not gonna get even pulls on my intake strokes. So I just wanted to combine those two. It literally just all I had to do is unplug a hose and put a pulse sensor on there just to see what would show up and it, like I said it really didn't give me anything that I could see on the intake side of things uh, the only thing I could see is possibly how it lines up with a intake pulse either way it's all pieces to the puzzle with this Honda because I could I just went ahead and stuck a pulse sensor in the exhaust and um, kinda did the same test now 
With this, you can see I've, I'm synchronized with my ignition events again. And you can see cylinder number, this, this pulse right here is kind of lining up with cylinders four exhaust event. This pulse right here is lining up with two's exhaust event. This pulse lines up with five's exhaust event. This one is three's exhaust event. This one's six's exhaust event. And lastly, we've got one. So each one of them has a nice little dip. If you, and once again, like I mentioned before, there was no drivability issue with this vehicle, just the noise. So, you know, I didn't know really what I was expecting. It only took literally uh, 20 or 30 seconds to put that in there and run this. So it wasn't that big of a deal. I just kind of wanted to see if there was obviously an exhaust issue, a, a real one, uh, other than a noise, I'd probably have a drivability complaint and I might be able to see an issue on this pattern. Uh, a lot of technicians, when they do have a drivability issue, a misfire, a random misfire, or something along those lines, they'll do a cranking test. They'll disable the ignition or the fuel and then they'll crank it and check the exhaust because the cranking event will be a little slower the patterns would most typically be a little bit more even and uh, you might get a little more clarity and see if there's a cylinder that's not doing its job but like i said there's no drivability issue on this one i just kind of want to experiment Here's another example of using this pulse sensor to detect noise. Uh, this was on a 2013 Suburban, 5.3 liter engine on it. It, it, in it, it had a just a kind of a faint knocking sound. I know you can't see that from looking at this image here and I don't have a recording to, so you could hear what it sounds like, but uh, you could see pretty much that um, the noise happens just before the cylinder one e exhaust event also happens maybe between be just before at the end of the cylinder four exhaust event or the beginning of cylinder four's intake event or I guess it could be cylinder six's the end of cylinder six's intake event now it just so happens that cylinders one seven four and six um, are the displacement on demand or DOD cylinders and we know that these DOD uh, lifters seem to have some issues and this vehicle I think had 130, 140,000 miles. So um, I would probably kind of go in that direction, look at these um, displacement on demand lifters and probably give them a change. The customer wasn't really that concerned about it. So I guess they'll just have to keep their eye on it or their ear on it and see if it gets any worse. If it does, that's the direction that we would go with it. This one right here was kind of fun. This uh, student, at least for me, the student had a Mustang and he had a modified 351 in there and it was cammed out a little bit, had Holly fuel injection, coilover plugs, a really nice setup, a little race car. And a uh, freshly rebuilt engine, just a few hundred miles on it and it was creating a pretty good top end noise. So we put a, in, and it was also misfiring on cylinder five. So we put the in-cylinder pressure transducer in there. That's what you see in blue. And we've got our pulse sensor picking up the noise. And you can see this red spot, this red pop right here. That's the valve train noise. And then in green, you can see there's ignition overlay. It looks like it fires the coil every ro rotation of the crankshaft. So we actually can span it. Like right now, it's the, the overlay is spanned across the ignition event, but probably should have spanned it across peak to peak on our... Um, PV or our, our pressure waveform. Either way, you can see the noise kind of lines up with the exhaust to intake transition. And if you look on cylinder five, that's right when the exhaust and the intake exhaust closes and the intake opens. And one thing that you can see right away is towards the end of that exhaust um, stroke, pressure builds up a little bit. It kind of is flatlined and then boop, it kind of jumps right up. And that's a pretty good indication that the exhaust valve is closing too soon. Since this is a single cam, uh, it's probably a better indication that the exhaust valve uh, or the exhaust cam lobe is worn out or the lifter is worn out. And that would also cause that noise. So anyway, that's what it ended up being when we took it apart. It had the cam lobe was a little wiped out and the lifter was wiped out. 
and that was causing the misfire and the noise. And the root cause for the failure, we found out, is that the push rods were too long and they were operating the rocker arms kind of out of its neutral position, if you will. And it was operating at an extreme. And I think the rocker arms were binding up there on the rocker arm studs, probably putting undue pressure on the lifter and cam. And that led to its ultimate demise. And he's replaced this all with uh, the right size rockers, uh, right size push rods, and a roller cam and a roller lifter set. So it's all good now. So hopefully this piqued your interest, and now you're going to run out and build yourself a few of these pulse sensors. You could probably build three of them for less than 30 bucks. So it's one more piece of equipment you've got in the arsenal to help you pinpoint a problem or diagnose it, especially without having to do some major teardown. Like I said before, it's always good to use this type of information before you tear something down, so that way if you don't see something when you're in there, you can refer back to this and say, okay, I want to look at these areas with a fine tooth comb, maybe with a magnifying glass, and really study some of these parts. But if you don't want to build one on your own, you can, of course, always buy the first look sensor. AESWave.com sells those, um, I think, as well as many others. You can go to the Senex Tech dot com website another place that sells pulse sensors there's a guy that makes them it's jarhead diagnostics and uh, i think it's just jarhead diagnostics.com he's got a lot of scope accessories and some things that he makes himself including the pulse sensors he's even, he's even got one shaped like a grenade which is pretty cool um, so anyway hopefully this is helpful and if you have any questions please comment thank you